is SJEN-TV. My name is Karen Nolkemper, and I'm your host for today's program. With us today are two amazing guests. We have Janine Marone, who is the board chair of Support After Abortion, and Lisa Rowe, who is the CEO of Support After Abortion. Ladies, welcome, and thank you for being here. Thank you. Karen. Thank you. Yeah, I'm so excited about what you're doing uh, and the timing of what's happening now, too, with support after abortion. I know, as we all know, uh, together, literally tens of millions of women, men, and children and families have been profoundly impacted by abortion. I know we all know that from what you do and, and my previous role in pro-life. And we know those families are out there and they're looking for help and support after abortion. So I love the name of your organization right out of the box, Support After Abortion. That's so clear and important. So if you can, I did a little homework. I was on your website and I see that maybe around 2016 you were getting going and then 2018 was your launch of Support After Abortion. And so you've only been around a couple of years so maybe take us back before we delve into what exactly you do. Give us an understanding of the foundation, how you got started. So Janine, I know that's where you come in as the board chair for Support After Abortion. So tell us a little bit more, how did you get started? Well, I never thought we would be here, but I'll tell you exactly how we got okay. started. I'm a founder of something called Luncheons for Life. Mm -hmm. It's a grassroots networking luncheon for like-minded people. When I had originally gotten involved with Luncheons for Life, quite frankly, it was a networking luncheon, and I like networks. I thought it would be fun. So a co-partner and I who was involved in pro-life, she was the development director for a maternity home. She had the pro-life background. I had the business background. And we put together Luncheons for Life in early 2012. The way it works is that we, we have a, a guest speaker, if you will, sure. someone who we showcase. And we talk about whatever the, the items are in pro-life. And then at the end of the, uh, we have a meal, and at the end we pass the mic and we talk about things that are going on in the community. Well, for the first six months of Luncheons for Life, we were showcasing pregnancy centers in the area. And each pregnancy center did fundamentally the same thing. So by the time the sixth pregnancy center came along, the executive director wanted to do something different, and she brought in her facilitator of an abortion program for those that have been impacted by abortion, a healing program after abortion. The woman that conducted it had had an abortion. So for the first time in my life, I would suppose, I realized that there was more than one victim to an abortion. There might have been 60 or so other people in the room at that time, and you could have heard a pin drop as this woman described her experience with abortion, her regret, her shame, and her recovery. And from that moment on, uh, it really kind of, it was that one woman's testimony on this one program of healing that, that changed forever my idea of what needed to happen in her life. I like what you said, have that moment in time when you realize there was more than one victim more than one person who was suffering and struggling. It really impacted the whole family structure, if you will. The, the woman, the man, maybe parents, grandparents, siblings, others. And to hear her story of healing and recovery, how powerful. So that was the initial catalytic point. In 2013. In 2013. Mm -hmm. Wow, so not that many years ago. Absolutely. Well, fast forward then from 2013 to what happened after that to where you all are now today. Well, the luncheons were so successful, it galvanized our community, not just of the people that were uh, acting in pro-life, whether they be in front of an abortion facility or the like, but agencies. Okay. So we got in the habit of at the end of every year, we would get the agencies together and we would talk about some strategic initiative that we would, that we would do that would make a difference in our community. Well, this had been gnawing on me for years. So this is 2013. By the time 2017 rolls around, or 2016, at the end of 2016, I had thrown out to the group, why don't we look at all of these after-abortion programs that I think we have and try and figure out a way to inventory them, see what we have. I realized they might have been different. I knew that people who had had abortion experiences were certainly all different. And maybe we could come up with something like a central intake like you see in hunger and homeless uh, shelters, or, shelters facilities. Or, or facilities or agencies, where in, in many states they have something called 211. You call into 211, 
and you have an operator who, who helps discern what your specific needs are, and then they send you to the agency that you're best suited. So that was kind of my vision for it. And so I threw that out there to the group and said, you know, we can find underwriters to, to, to do this. And so in early 2017, one of the pregnancy centers said, we think we'd like to do that, and we have just the person to do it. So we launched the discovery phase of what ultimately became support after abortion in January of 2017 to determine exactly what did we have out there. Now initially we thought this was just going to be something from Southwest Florida. That's where I live. Even though we have Luncheons for Life in more places in Southwest Florida, this, is the, this was our incubator, if you will, for this incredible concept that we had no idea would develop into what it is today. Yeah, wonderful. Well, thank you. That's like you said, developing into what it is today. And that's going to probably lead me over to Lisa to, to find out a little bit more about today. So that brings us from 2013 to 2017 to starting with that discovery phase and then the central point of contact. You need that central repository. And then doing the research that you did to say, how do we uh, replicate these best practices that are being utilized in other agencies to put that forward with support after abortion for those who've been impacted? by abortion. So, all right, well, I think if I'm not mistaken, so we're going to then fast forward to 2017. We're getting closer to 2018, a, a time of the launch officially. Close, am I close? Uh, close enough. Close <laughs> enough. Okay. Well, let's jump in and let me go ahead and if you wouldn't mind just sharing with us then a little bit how, what transpired from there, from 2017 to where absolutely. you're at right now and what you're doing. And I think that there's a piece of this that's absolutely important. There is a part of Janine's background her business mindedness, her strategic right. marketing that she brings to the table in the pro-life movement. Having worked in the pro-life movement, I'm sure you can understand how necessary it is that we bring a, bit, a business sense right. to our work, right? And so that's what really in 2017 became the impetus for where we are now because as Janine said, there was definitely a desire to learn what was out there. We saw a broken piece of the puzzle and we wanted to find out what that was. We had no idea. We just knew that people were underserved. And so in 2017, the pregnancy center that I worked at was the one that picked up this idea and said, Janine, we, we agree with what you're saying. We're willing to try this out, whatever this is. Sure. And so for three years inside the pregnancy center, that Petri dish or the incubator is exactly what we learned that the nation was craving in abortion healing. So we were able to learn about the 200 programs that are being offered around our country to men and women who've experienced abortion. What is it that they're offering? How they're reaching people? But we also were able to learn maybe what the weaknesses are or the sure. gaps, right? right? And so as we began to understand that, we began to cultivate different proof of concepts is what we call them. Sure. And so we learned there was a real need for confidentiality, anonymity. There was a real need to create an options-based approach, not just a one-way road right. to healing. And as a licensed clinical social worker, that was so imperative to me because when you go in to work with a client or a group or a family, it, we don't tell them how to go about right. their healing. We ask them, sure. what are your goals? What do you see for your future? Right. How would you like this to look? And that wasn't happening in our industry. And so as we began to cultivate this understanding, we began to develop programming that complemented that approach. And simultaneously, with the strategic mindedness right. that Janine brings to the table, we brought about consumer research. So we brought the anecdotal experience that we were sharing at the pregnancy center to the consumer research and together we have this amazing product that we're here to talk about support after abortion that actually became a 501c3 in April of 2020 in the midst of the pandemic. Wow. I mean, that's only God, right? right? And so together with both of those pieces, we are serving the nation and even internationally with a better understanding of how to reach the millions of men and women that you shared about, the families, all of those people who are experiencing abortion in a different way so that we can truly grow the capacity. Because right now, as I mentioned, we're completely underserving this group of people and we could say for a million reasons you know we've over politicized abortion over spiritualized abortion we have not been able to create a human connection to abortion because of all the things that our country has done and so we are really trying to help educate the world on how to bring this to your living room how to bring this into your family yeah. and so that's who we are today oh wow 
Fantastic. And I love what you both are saying about mirroring the business piece with the compassion and the Absolutely. clinical healing piece. That's what we all need. So that's the beauty of what you all offer with support after abortion, to be research-centered, what works, what doesn't work, to really gather that data so you know how to mobilize and offer things in a way, as you were saying, that's options-based. Absolutely. So maybe if you could speak a little bit more in terms of what does that mean in terms of options-based, what does that look like, and then how are you sharing that with some of the other centers out there? How are you getting the word out there about your options-based services sure. and resources? And so we consider ourselves a multiplier. I love that you used a similar word. You know, it's really important to note that we are not a program among programs. There are many of wonderful programs doing this work. But what we realized when we came on the scene is they weren't communicating with one another. They didn't know each other existed. We had a program in California who didn't know about a program in Texas. And so we are really bringing about a, a place for collaboration to take place, for leaders to learn from one another, for leaders to learn from the proof of concepts that we have learned from through the research. And so together, we're creating a space for the millions of men and women who need help to grow together to create the capacity. And so as an options-based program, what that means is that if California has a program that has a specific, maybe offering sexual abuse healing connected to it, and then in Texas, there's a program that's offering sibling support for after abortion care, we are now integrating all of those programs together to serve the community better. Oh, wonderful, that's outstanding. It makes so much sense. So. Talk to me, too, a little bit about, I'm sure people are thrilled to hear about this, and I know that you have a website and involved with social media, so how are you mobilizing the troops, if you will, and how are you getting the word out to different agencies, organizations, churches, and individuals? If you could speak a little bit about that. that. A couple of things that I'd really like kind of to clear up, Karen. Mm -hmm. uh, one is that, and Lisa said this, there's none, no one size fits all in right. abortion healing, just like there's no one doctor to cure all of your illnesses, whether right. it's dermatology sure. or it's dentistry, sure. as we talk. That's number one. And number two, we know that it's lifetime healing, so there's no one mm -hmm. and done. Mm -hmm. So as just like any illness that we have, we may start right. one place and we continue down a progression until we're either fully healed or our right. time has expired. But the, the, that's the whole idea. Now, as far as that goes from there, I'd really like to a little bit launch into what we learned from the research. Yes, please. And I think that's really critical. Part of what I saw that, that really was on my heart to, to even bring this whole idea up to begin with is I knew if there's 60 million children have died, they all had parents, right. grandparents and siblings, and we had all of these, this plethora of programming in our communities, but yet it, to me it seemed like no one was going there, no one was being healed. So what is the problem? Sure. Mm -hmm. Or what is the challenge? Sure. And for where I come from, it's either one of two things. It's either a marketing problem or a product problem. Unfortunately, sometimes it's both. both. And that's what we found out. Okay. We did consumer research. Consumer yes. research is really just looking at the United States in, in its, all of its population and saying, what are your appetites? Right. Whether it's a car or a Coca-Cola. Sure. It's all about trying to understand consumer appetites. That's different than clinical. Clinical follows individuals over time. Sure. This is a snapshot in time. So what we did is we actually did for women first. We took a snapshot of America. We used a consumer marketing firm. And we learned, we talked to over 200 women who have had abortions and were willing to talk to us about that experience and ask them a few questions. The first thing that we learned is they did want anonymity. Over 80% 80, 80 of the women said that that was important to them or very important to them. Right. We also asked them about their interest in a faith-based program mm -hmm. or a non-faith-based program. Okay. We were shocked to learn that over 80% were not interesting in having, interested in having a gospel-led message. Okay. So initially. For, initially. Initially. Sure, yeah. sure. Very big word. But sure. yet, yeah. everything that we had, with limited exception, was leading with that message. So right away, you know, the red flag goes up and we see, all right, anonymity is important, but the programs that we have are in retreat-based settings or Bible-based settings sure. with other people in person. Got it. So right away, the red flags are coming up that maybe sure. we have a product 
issue. It's yeah. not appealing to the market. Mm -hmm. As we move on a little further, we also find out that the women involved, we asked this questions, were not attending religious services. Mm -hmm. And we can come up with a lot of reasons why that's happening, right. but clearly yeah. the disenfranchise or the, or the self-condemnation right. of women from, from the act of what they did could be part of the problem, as sure. well as the potential condemnation of going into a religious setting. And finally, <clears throat> the most important thing that we learned is when asked where to go mm -hmm. for healing, over 90% said they did not know or mentioned Planned Parenthood. Wow, over 90% over 90%. said they did not know or they so mentioned Planned Parenthood. So that often can come from perhaps we're not naming them right. So as you know, most of right. our programs have names that do not really indicate what they do. Very true. Very good point. So that's, that's probably the, the biggest thing that I can say that became the, um, the driving force. Yes, we learned so much anecdotally and through experience, and it pointed to what's the problem. The research pointed back to the experience, and they came together to say, this is what we need to do with women. And I'm not ready to talk about it yet, but we've also done similar research with men. Okay. And the results are equally as astounding, but with, with a few twists, and we'll have to talk about that sure, at a later time. Sure, Oh, I'd love to. And thank you. You touched in the right direction there about the research. And just for me to, to summarize and for the viewers to, to hear this too, so the anonymity, the women went at anonymity, um, initially, initially, not so much in a faith-based setting, right. okay, because it was being offered in retreat settings or other church-related settings. Got it. And then also looking at how to do this. You had another point about the research. You, you mentioned anonymity and there was uh, something else. And then too. Um, not knowing where to go. Not knowing where to go. So how do they find out and probably labeling. And I'm going to turn this sure. back over to Lisa to put, okay. to put that research into well, what does that mean in numbers? How do you translate the fact that you have men and women who are willing, who have had adverse effects from their abortion, right. who are willing to get help if they knew where to, to go. go. Mm -hmm. If you take that together with what we gleaned out of the research right. and you applied it to Americans, American men and women over the age of 18, and you get... The research says, our okay. research says yes, that 22 please. million men and women if wow. they knew where to go for help right now in our nation, they would reach out for support. That's amazing. And 22 million that's right. men and women, if they knew where to go, would reach out for support. That's huge. So that just further confirms what you're doing. So the research confirms, and that number is staggering. And I think I identify so adverse so I effects. Yes. Like willing to go. suicide, Correct. depression, right. Right. anxiety, family issues. Right. You, the list Guilt. goes on right. and on right. 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 of the underlying trauma that abortion causes. Right. But because nobody's talking about it, right. or because they're hidden within programs that nobody know, uh, knows sure. about, we sure. are struggling to get the message out. And we have been for the better part of 50 years. Right. Oh, absolutely right. So tell me, well, first of all, thank you for doing that research. That's what we need to do, as we absolutely. all know, in order to be successful with the program. Well, thank and this lady. This. Yes, she's okay, a, well, team up, definitely. She's the secret to, sauce. The secret the, sauce, <laughs> okay. But it takes to, again, having the business acumen, the research, the strategy to marry with the clinical compassion, and then looking at the communication piece uh, is the next step, too. So talk to me, kind of, I'm, I'm intrigued. So this is what you've learned. So where are you heading? I do know a little bit. I've done my research. I saw the virtual conference. I know some of the different ways you're reaching out to address those points of anonymity and where to go and communicating. And so take me further in terms of specifically some of the offerings and the things that you're doing based well, on the research. Well, let's talk about the scope because I think that's really important mm -hmm. for the viewers to know. Right. We know one in four women <clears throat> is impacted by abortion by the age of 45. And our country is beginning to embrace that right. men are also included in that that number right. so we are we have a country bleeding from the impacts of abortion right. now we have more than four decades right of men and women who have experienced abortion so we know it to be a generational issue right, right. much like poverty divorce mental right. health right? right so we have great grandparents grandparents mm -hmm. parents and now great grandchildren who've experienced abortion. And so this is a systemic issue right. that if not spoken to is going to continue. And so for the pro-life movement who's listening to see 
a program that is healing people, an organization like ours that is bringing programs together to help heal people as part of the secret sauce, like we said before, to sure. ending the demand for abortion. Right. We know that out of the one million abortions that are happening every year, 50% are repeat abortions. Wow. That means that there is a woman that is walking into a clinic right now who's already had an abortion. Right. I have met with tons of women. We've experienced many testimonies that if that woman would have experienced help and somebody would have spoken to her with compassion, passion yeah. and she knew there was a safe place to go she wouldn't go back into that clinic a second third fourth time there's a desperateness that comes with walking into that clinic and women can't see outside of that their chaos right. or their circumstances and so we want the pro-life movement to know that healing needs to be a part of ending the demand for abortion it's a part of the equation absolutely that makes so much sense when you think about it from a logical standpoint, a human rights issue, a human issue, a, when you just really step back, it makes complete sense. It has to be that clinical piece, that healing piece, because that when, that's when you're made whole, you're restored. Absolutely. There's that freedom, and you're breaking free from the guilt, shame, depression, and moving forward with that complete healing. And healing, again, is about restoration, being made whole. And who doesn't want that? And, Absolutely. And the only way to end something that's negative, that, that uh, it really adversely impacts people, is to find that freedom and that healing. And, and that's why I wanted to better explain the scope, because sure. if our country understood the right. need for healing. Right. I believe we'd walk with greater compassion and that's where it starts. If we can start having right. this conversation inside of our families, if we can stop right. being judgmental on the sidewalk, if we can bring it into our churches and begin to offer a new way of looking at abortion. We're not saying abortion is right, that's not what we're saying, but we're saying there's people in your pews, there's people right. in your family that have experienced abortion. We need to speak to them Otherwise, they're in secret. They tell us all the time, these women who've experienced right. abortion, it's socially acceptable, but nobody's talking about right. it. So as a pro-life movement, we're commissioned to begin right. talking about it with compassion and to begin inviting those conversations so people can feel safe in sharing their feelings and to understand that there's next steps for them. Right, I love it. Mm -hmm. And I love part of the leadership training, if I'm not mistaken, that you all offer looking at language, the importance of the assessment, and then crafting appropriate language that connects and resonates and inspires. And to your point, Lisa, it doesn't deny what's occurred, but it's reaching out with Absolutely. compassion. Again, think about it. Words matter. They do. We all know that words matter. What you say or don't say is so critical in terms of opening that dialogue with others. And I think on your website, there were four steps or a handful of steps just really talking about what we need to do. and dialogue and assessing and crafting the appropriate message and creating that safe space, or that safe place where people can begin to share their journey. Absolutely. So I wanted to talk about something on your website too, and thank you for clarifying the scope. Because yes. I think for people to realize, as you mentioned, one in four women by the time they've reached their 45th birthday, one in four women, so that's 25% will have been impacted yeah. by an abortion. That's huge. That's huge. And like I said, as people begin to grasp the scope and the numbers, say, wait a minute, maybe that's somebody I know sitting next to me in class or work or church or a relative or a neighbor. So then how do I reframe this so I can be a vehicle or a vessel to facilitate wholeness and hope and healing versus somebody who's coming across maybe uninformed and continuing a narrative that is not helpful to ending abortion or helpful to facilitating the healing of, of the individual Absolutely. and the family impacted. Yes. So, yes. Talk to me, if you will, I love on the website, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you talk about inspiring compassion and you started to speak about that a moment ago. Uh -huh. inspiring the C's. Compassion. The C's, that's right. Good, mm -hmm. good marketing. I knew there was a joint effort there with the marketing. Inspire compassion because I remembered it. It worked. Right. And then to promote a collaboration. I definitely want to dive Another into collaboration. Scene. Another yep. C, that's right. And then also to build capacity. Mm -hmm. Capacity for abortion healing nationwide. Did I do okay? You did. Okay, good, good. All right, well it worked. So marketing <laughs> genius. You did your homework. I did my homework. That's right. So if you can, let's go through, because I think it's so important to look at how specifically, how are we inspiring compassion? You touched on that. I want to look at build at uh, promoting collaboration. That's huge. I want to delve into what that might look like on a strategic and practical level 
and then leading into obviously building capacity for abortion healing nationwide. So, Absolutely. so either one of you, however you want to break break that apart, I'd love to break down the C's and talk about how do we operationalize that for maximum. Let impact. me take the compassion because I think that's the easiest thing, thing for every viewer to mm -hmm. become involved in. This movement is over 50, well, 50 years old from uh, Roe v. Wade. Mm -hmm. And when, when abortion was first about, everything was abortion is murder, understanding that the baby is not a clump of cells. We're past that right. to the point where 50% of the abortions are on someone who has had an abortion. Mm -hmm. The need to understand that there is healing, the, the need to understand that there's other victims and that people don't wake up in the morning or you know, as a small right. child think, I'm going to be a woman that has an abortion because I want to exercise my you know, my, my right over my body. This is just not, there are things that lead to the abortion. There is there is woundedness that, that happens that leads to the behavior yep. that leads right. to abortion. If we're not compassionate to that, then we can't, we can't prevent abortion and we right. certainly can't help the restoration that's needed afterwards. So for us, we call it from condemnation to compassion because we see so co much condemnation inside the pro-life movement that right. does not recognize the need for healing. So part of our mission is to continue to elevate the message, the language, the understanding, and the reasoning to say, right. this is not your grandfather's Oldsmobile. Right. The times have changed. Right. The, it's not the same message from 1973 or 1974. And dispel the belief system that if you do support a woman after an abortion, that it's not anti... You're not complicit. Right. You're, right, you're right, not right. condoning. Dispel that myth for, for right, the viewers. Right, right, right. Norsi is yeah. right. But we're there with you every step of the way. That's what mm -hmm. I love. And going back to one of the original giants within this movement, um, Monsignor Philip Riley out of New York. Just lit I learned so much everybody, from him. Everybody talks about him. Oh, Which my goodness. Him. He's an amazing giant. And just talked about that level that you're walking with somebody. And Janine, to your very point, speaking to the woundedness that led somebody to thinking that this is their only option. They're in that crisis mode, that crisis mentality. And as you said so beautifully, people don't wake up saying, this is what I want to do. I'm looking forward to going through with an abortion experience. No, that's not the case at all. What is it that led up to it? So getting back to looking at root causes. Root causes, and we all know that's the key to, to heal any particular situation, but especially in dealing with the women who are struggling with the decision, as well as men and men and the families. Yeah, women, men, and families, absolutely. absolutely. So really, um, I'm so excited that you say that, and if we could not only change the mindset by communicating that, but then giving people the proper language and tools. How do you reach out? How do you minister to them? How do you find out? How do you ask questions in love? And how do you speak the truth in love? Leading them a certain way. And then Lisa, to your point, you're not being complicit. You're meeting them where they're at, using language that resonates, that's comforting, and then you're leading them in the right direction through that connection of building that rapport and using the right language and the right message. Absolutely. And I, I, I've heard from folks that are beginning to embrace this message and understand it, they begin to see themselves as men and women who have right. root issues, right. who have struggled in life sure. with one area of their life or another, and begin to see themselves as somebody who could have walked in that particular individual's experience. And so as we begin to bridge that, there's, there's a compassion that begins to right. build, a love and an empathy that sure. we really need in our culture. As, as a clinician, I say this all the time. Sure. I have worked with sex trafficking survivors, teen parents, foster children. I have worked with a lot of men and women who have experienced trauma. I have never seen such an egregious response to trauma in the way I do with abortion. I've never seen such a divide. In, in all of these other areas I spoke about, there's such a lean inward sure. um, effect that I see with people that want to help. Right. And there's this lean outward effect that happens with abortion. But it's the same woman. It's the right. same man with, right. a, with a different symptom to the root issue. Right. And so the more we can understand that as a culture, the more we really truly can right. end abortion. Right. Mm -hmm. I want to build on one thing you just said. What I'm excited about in terms of hopeful going forward, there is a movement to better understand trauma-informed care. Absolutely. So I love that. And I'm seeing that uh, permeate various institutions, agencies, mental health uh, you know, clinics, facilities, as well as 
people with whom we uh, encounter too. So Absolutely. it's very important so that they're educated on that language and what happens. Like mm -hmm. you said, lean in versus lean out. Yes. I think sometimes people maybe are afraid of messy and that's why people need to also realize what where their gifts are and maybe where they should maybe step to another direction and pray and let somebody else kind of carry the torch. It's one body, many parts. So how do we engage where God is calling us and using our gifts? So I mean, yeah. it's sort of like what we've yeah. seen with so many of our military men. We've right. learned about trauma through military and war yes. engagement and so on. But we also have trauma of other sorts which carry very, very similar side That's effects. Right. right. Very true. In, in all things, right. abortion and in other areas, right. whether it's abuse or it's human trafficking that Lisa has talked about, and it's not just in, in war, it's, right. it's beyond that. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. And I love what you said about Jean, about this trauma, and if people realize, I don't want to say trauma is trauma, not to say one is equal, but the effects, the impact mm -hmm. is similar, and so how do we engage in that, and how do we become vessels and, and instruments to navigate that, to direct from a point of view of, of getting somebody whole and restored. So how do, can God use us? But I do think, I know the battle is interesting because like you said, a lot of the language, it's not your grandfather's Oldsmobile. So how can we gently take people out of that? So that's gonna lead me to the next C, to collaboration. So Absolutely. if you all can speak to collaboration, how do you promote collaboration? Yes. Okay, you're getting the official handoff from Janine to Lisa, okay. And Lisa. as I mentioned earlier, it's right. great because we talked about the program in California mm -hmm. not knowing the program right. in Texas. Right. and. Um, one program who feels like their way is the way to healing because they, they that's how they found their own healing. Sure. And as we said before, it's not a one size fits all. If we're talking about trauma, right. tr everybody needs their own way to healing and right. m multiple ways. Like we said, it's a lifetime adventure. And so the collaboration piece is bringing the leaders in our country together, bringing clergy together, Great. clinicians together, pregnancy center directors, CEOs of organizations sure. like yours to better understand how they can be addressing right there right. in their community that they have influence over, how do we bring about the conversation of abortion and how do we help people find healing? Things as simple as adding a question to your intake form, sure. right? Offering a program as part of your healing ministry. There's so many different things that seem so easy and practical to us as sure. we speak, but are like foreign language to many of these organizations because they see what they see. And so to invite them into a monthly meeting every month, bringing them together around a table with other sure. leaders, and then offering them new ideas, new ways of thinking, letting them connect and network together. Yeah. And then we've offered a series of, of virtual conferences, three, in fact, since COVID. Wow. And we have a fourth one coming up in October, specifically addressing men's issues around abortion and trauma but this is how we're bringing like-minded individuals together educating right and we have had so many people say I've been praying for this for eight years I felt Great. all alone in this movement and it's like you're not alone okay. and uh, simultaneously as support after abortion was becoming its own 501c3 a program or a coalition came about called of the abortion recovery coalition there's about 30 providers on that coalition okay. that are coming together every month and also sharing ideas and learning that they're not alone and exchanging different best practices so it's inspiring a shift in our in our movement and in our industry to have conversations sometimes for the first time wow you that is I, go ahead I was going to say you know what yes. I think is very important too um, and with being a Catholic um, and I know you've had, that, your, that your audience is probably very many Catholics, but and you're thinking Project Rachel. Was Project Rachel the answer to everything? By the way, do any of all of you know who Project Rachel is? That's many don't because it doesn't say that it's an abortion recovery program. Right. Right. What I'm hearing from my peers across the United States and, and Catholic communities is how do we get more people to come to our program? And the answer is what we've just been saying. Right. As long as right. it's an out in the open piece, there's right. not that anonymity, and right. maybe they're not ready for the sure. heavy faith part of that program. Maybe there's another healing capability that's online, or sure. it can be done on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Sure. Maybe Project Rachel is the third entity that's sure. seen down the road. Nothing against Project Rachel, but it may right. not be meeting those men and women where they are with what they need at the moment. Right. And that's what's so important about collaboration. It gets people to see, well, there are other things out there, or how can I modify and adapt what I do? Right. Maybe I can take this 
online. Right. Right. You know, just taking what you have right now and putting it online or doing it from another city. There are so many ways to take all of this information that we know and work with other entities across the country, even within Project Rachel, right. to do it differently, to be more attractive to those at least 22 million people, 25% of them are Catholic, sure. and maybe they're not ready for a Catholic program. Sure. Healing Absolutely. happens regardless. Sure. As any individual takes that first step to become healed from whatever it is, God gets involved. Right. And we just can't forget that. No. I love it. God gets involved and we can't forget that. That is beautiful and that's perfect. Even if it doesn't come with a, uh, with a, with a gospel message at the end. Right. God is still involved. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's exciting. And that's what, what I'm excited about is what you all are doing to change the landscape, to give people courage, resources, tools, options, options that are based on research centered, uh, I'm sorry, research centered findings and, and all, and to, to share that and to collaborate. And I think people be willing and excited. I know different dioceses, hopefully you've had some receptivity with the different dioceses saying, come Absolutely. and tell us more, or share with us, and how are you networking? So hopefully you're finding that to be a good uh, avenue throughout the various states and the various dioceses. So I think it, since you brought up the kind of the Catholic um, component of this, there's nothing that we're doing that's uncatholic, but we are ecumenical. I think that's right. And that really means that we're all very, very Christian. Some right. of us are Catholic. But the moral of the story is we do understand meeting people where they are. Right. And as St. Ignatius says, we have to go through their door to get them out through ours. Absolutely. And I, that, that's probably my biggest message for anybody in this audience because I've met so many that, that are in healing, that have been closed-minded to, that's, right. oh, it's, if it's, it's, only, it's my way or the highway. Right. Is that really what we want? Right. You know, are, there are so many different ways to begin that healing process. And I love to say to anybody who will listen to me, in terms of evangelization, as a Christian community across all denominations, if we could collectively find the way to heal those, and it's more than 22 million that have been impacted, it's just 22 million that we know that are willing to be healed, right. those up to 60 million plus, right. if we could find a way to build that capacity to promote that healing, those men and women are going to go back to the religion from which they came because they know that God is the ultimate healer, but it's got to begin somewhere. Amen. And with that open-minded, compassionate, collaborative way of meeting men and women where they are right. to promote healing from abortion. Mm -hmm. Love it. Absolutely love it. This is very, very exciting. I know we're getting somewhat close to time, so I just want to ask you uh, kind of two follow-up questions towards the end. Sort of the biggest challenges you see on the horizon and the biggest, what are you most excited about that's around the corner? Maybe those two kind of dovetail together. So challenge and opportunity and kind of an aha, what you're excited about that might be leading to next steps and what you see. I take challenges. You say the, the okay. next okay. steps. Uh -huh. So I see our challenges as being, as we mentioned, the political nature of abortion, okay. the spiritual nature of abortion, sure. the old rhetoric, the old narrative around yes. abortion, the old ways of being around right. abortion. This is a new idea. And what I hope people heard with what Janine just shared is that we're accomplishing exactly the same goal in a new and more innovative, meet people where they sure. are. Our community, our culture has grown. We need to grow with it. Sure. And there's a lot of just antiquated belief systems and antiquated ways of being that needs to understand that we are now 50 years past right. when Roe vs. Wade was passed. And we need to look at this issue now with 50 years advancement and not back in the 80s. And so I love, Janine, always, you brought this to my attention. We talk about abortion as it relates to maybe nicotine use. How long did it take us to understand oh, how nicotine right. has affected the, the human being, our, our medical issues? Every time I turn on the TV, the CDC has some sort of nicotine awareness commercial going on right now. We are there with abortion. We understand 
the woundedness, both physically and emotionally, that comes with abortion. And so we need to understand that abortion healing is a part of the equation. And I, right. we feel that that has not yet been absorbed by everyone. And so to get this message out among viewers here right. is so imperative. Right. And to get our leaders speaking. Our leaders are still terrified to speak about abortion in fear that they might hurt somebody or offend somebody. And to know that if you're not talking about it, then there nobody else is talking about it. And so we really, really see that the conversation needs to start. Another area that I would say, and then I, I'd pass the baton, is that this has been the seventh or tenth or non-issue for a lot of people, abortion. So in pregnancy centers, oftentimes abortion healing is an afterthought. We get a, a volunteer and they have had an abortion and they want to provide healing. While they're there in that two-month period vacationing in Florida, they offer a healing program. It's an afterthought. It's not intentional. It's not a delivery system. And I once heard that, you know, second to an ultrasound is an abortion healing testimony in terms of impact. So we need to make it. And you know, as a clinician, we're not taught in grad school, in public grad right. school, how to talk to grief and loss as a reg right. in regards to abortion. Right. So those are just some. I mean, there's a multitude of issues. But those are some of the bigger issues that we see as we deliver our message. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. No, that's exciting. I just was going to mm -hmm. say one thing that you said about the, the language that we want to hear about the ahas and the next steps. So what's, what's exciting in terms of next steps? But looking at um, the, the language piece about talking about, you just mentioned grief and loss, Absolutely. reproductive grief and loss, rather than using other words that were hot button words or inflammatory words that would trigger somebody versus talking about reproductive grief and loss. You know? Absolutely. So it's just so critical as we go forward. So I'm excited about what you're doing in the churches and with other leaders to educate them on the language as they begin to reach out with a new lens, a new perspective. Yes, so. thank you for understanding yes. that. Oh, you're very welcome. Yes, yes. I've got a clinical a piece to my background as well, too. So I, I love where you're heading and thank what you're you. doing. So yes, and Janine, tell so me about So all the C's, we talked right. about compassion, collaboration, capacity. Well, we believe that we're, we're in the throes of something called being a catalyst for change. Our industry just doesn't need another call center who can do an options-based approach to healing, right. and we're that call center. That is not our advocate. That's not what we're advocating. We're advocating that all of us that are leaders in in abortion, whatever, whether it's a pregnancy center or the like, have to have the view that healing is part of that solution. Absolutely. And quite frankly, we have looked at even abortion healing really like this. Sure. Not just from a perspective of how we design the programs but it's a thing for women. Men are the answer, have always been sure. the answer, and have been villainized for so long in this movement. Everything that we are learning suggests that men hurt just as badly, if not sure. worse, are less likely involved in the decision sure. as the industry would suggest. And in many cases, in, in fact, half of the cases in our research say were not party to the decision at all and did not want that abortion to happen. If we can embrace that and open-mindedly look at men and, and creating that healing, looking at the language that we're using when men learn of a partner um, uh, uh, being pregnant, the things that they're saying are what they're taught to say, not what they want to say. And all of that becomes part of of our culture to end the demand for abortion. Mm, I think that for us, we've kind of known it for a while. We started a, a men's task force six months. We realized right. there's not a lot out there, that we have a lot to build. But we have a, an industry that's bigger than the abortion industry. It's just, as we all know, it's fragmented, it's siloed, sure. it's competitive, right. but it doesn't need to be that way. And to see support after abortion again, not as a program among programs, but as a place to be that catalyst for change, to end the demand for abortion by healing those that have been impacted by abortion is critical to the success of this movement. Absolutely. So there's a conference coming in October Good. Okay. Yes. that will highlight everything right. that Janine just shared about men. We're really thrilled about that. We're being very intentional about the delivery. It's going to be um, 
really founded on some research that Janine already shared about that hopefully we'll come back and share more. Sure, and indeed. so uh, we're really excited about it. And anybody that is interested can learn about it by visiting our website yeah. at supportafterabortion.com. We released our first mail podcast today. And so sign up for our newsletter. You'll receive weekly emails with those podcasts. And it's men with real life experiences sharing about their abortion and how it's impacted them. And we believe that the world is going to be changed by what they have to share. Absolutely. Wow. This is exciting. So stay tuned. In October, there'll be another conference. There will. And as we're getting to wrap up, is there are any final thoughts from either one of you just for our listeners to encourage them to visit your website or any final thoughts you'd like to share in terms of uh, how to get involved and how to support and, and spread the word? Absolutely. If you or somebody you know has experienced abortion, we want you to know that you are not alone. And we are here to help you and get you connected to the healing that you deserve because you are worthy. Contact us today by visiting our website at supportafterabortion.com. You can also call or text us at 844-289-HOPE. And there is somebody who has experienced abortion waiting to respond to your call or your text. If you're a leader or somebody who wants to learn more about how to get involved, there's also a Get Involved Now icon on our website. We'd love for you to click that button and get connected to us. And don't forget about that newsletter because we share updates weekly and provide you with all this Catalyst for Change content every week. Thank you so much. Yeah. Janine, Lisa, thank you very much for your amazing work and what you're doing with Support After Abortion. God bless you both. And you've been listening to SJEN-TV. My guests today have been Janine Marone, Board Chair of Support After Abortion, and Lisa Rowe, CEO of Support After Abortion. Thank you for joining us, and God bless.